my name is Rebecca Kemble. I'm a worker owner at Madison. Uh, no. I'm an alder at the Madison Common Council. I'm a worker owner at Union Cab uh, Cooperative um, and a former president of the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives and am engaged at international levels around worker co-op um, development. Um, in 2004, was it 14, Jackson Rising? Yes. 2014. Yes. Um, yeah, I think it was the year before that I became aware of the organizing efforts in Jackson, Mississippi and their Jackson Cush plan, part of which had to do with um, the city driving worker co-op development. And then what ensued from there in uh, that, that year of 2013 was when Chokwe Lumumba was running for mayor, is that right? Mm -hmm. um, and the uh, Malcolm X grassroots movement mobilized an amazing amount of political support internationally to come and uh, work for that campaign. Um, and that's when I first started hearing about things happening in, in Jackson. Um, they, they, they were able to win that election, Kali will tell you about that, and then convened uh, Jackson Rising Conference, this really big conference in Jackson, uh, to talk about um, cooperative economic development for the liberation of people within the context of cities. Um, and that was so inspiring to me, that combination of the sort of grassroots economic autonomous organization with seizing power at the municipal level, that that's when I actually decided to run for Common Council here. Um, because of after discussions with Kali and his comrades down there about how they organize for uh, municipal power. It was just so inspiring to me. So um, I'm really, really pleased and uh, grateful to be able to introduce Kali to our community today. Um, he is uh, the co-director now of Cooperation Jackson, uh, an organization that's emerged out of that political organization. Um, it's uh, an emerging network of worker co-ops and supporting institutions <coughs> that seeks to create economic democracy in a vibrant social solidarity economy in Jackson that will help to transform Mississippi and the South. Kali served as the Director of Special Projects and External Funding in the Merrill Administration of the late Chokwe Lumumba. His focus was supporting co-op development, sustainability, human rights, and international relations. He's also the former co-director of the U.S. Human Rights Network and served as the executive director of the People's Hurricane Relief Fund based in New Orleans, Louisiana after Hurricane Katrina. So please join me in welcoming hmm. Kali Akuno. Uh, well, first I want to thank all of you for coming um, and uh, thank for, thanks to the Haven Center for uh, making this exchange possible. Unfortunately, I'm a bit under the weather, so I am, I am nowhere near uh, full strength. Um, and it's very hard for me to talk loud, which is very unnormal, uh, atypical for, for me. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll try to speak up, but uh, it may go up and down, just given how my, my throat is, so I apologize for that. Um, giving how I'm feeling, um, I really want to mix it up with a lot of uh, questions. I think my mind will be much more sharp and equipped to do that. Uh, and I'll just start with a couple, couple of quick things, I think, to um, get us going uh, and people can kind of ask some questions. So a couple of things I think uh, that you won't necessarily, uh, if you're reading the Jackson Cush plan, if you're reading um, casting shadows uh, to get some update on our work and have some understanding of the work, which I encourage everybody to do. There are a couple of things that are implicit but not necessarily uh, stated uh, in there uh, um, that I want to just make a little bit more explicit. So one, one of the things, um, a lot of our work uh, is driven by an internal analysis that we have about uh, the disposability of black labor in this country. Uh, and a large part of our organization's uh, pursuit of cooperative development in many respects is uh, an autonomous, self-organized way to meet this challenge and to confront this challenge. Now what does that mean? Uh, 
you know, as, as uh, everyone here knows, uh, people of African descent, not exclusively, uh, they weren't the only population that was brought here to be uh, chattel slaves, but the, by far and away the majority. Um, we were brought here to labor. I mean, that was, that was the point. Uh, now that uh, automation uh, and production just in general has advanced to a particular point, there's less and less need for the types of particularly manual labor uh, that black workers want you to perform. Uh, either uh, in the fields uh, where most of that labor historically was concentrated on plantations, be it sugar or tobacco or rice or sorghum or anything else uh, in that nature that was a, a major cash crop in the world economy. Um, or on the low level uh, uh, for this kind of production models that's, that really picked up, uh, at least for black labor, uh, starting at the end of World War I uh, and kind of continued on until the 1970s. Right? Uh, that phase of uh, how production is situated has profoundly changed. Uh, and we constitute uh, one of many populations that are becoming virtually disposable within the world capitalist system, right? So it's not something that's isolated just to black people. But that's that's not what we're saying. There are many disposable populations in the current, you know, kind of world economy. But we are one within the very heart of the United States, within the very heart of the capitalist world order as we understand it. And that has some profound political uh, implications. So that's one thing to to read and see underneath all of that. The second thing, <coughs> the second thing, a big part of uh, our theory in the Mississippi context is how do you turn uh, a consolidated ma minority into a majority, right? How do you turn a consolidated minority into a majority? Again, what do we mean by that? You look at Mississippi's uh, particularly political history as it relates to electoral politics over the last 40 years. You see that there's a fundamental solid block of uh, black folks who vote uh, loyalty out of for the Democratic Party. Uh, but the Democratic Party is not a real consolidated institution in Mississippi and hasn't really been since the 1960s. It's also, it's in some respects, uh, a place that the Democratic Party fundamentally abandoned uh, after the emergence of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party Challenge, which first occurred in 1964, uh, with Fannie Lou Hamer and SNCC and COFO uh, went to Atlantic City and posed that challenge um, to the Democratic Party convention. They came up with some BS compromise that uh, folks didn't take. Uh, but over time, what that wind up meaning uh, is that black delegates could be uh, eventually were incorporated uh, within the party more fully by 1972. But what happened was that almost every single one of those white Democrats uh, fled into the Republican Party. And it pretty much left kind of a, a vacuum uh, in which the National Democratic Party, understanding that by, by the late 1960s, that black people were a population of American minority in Mississippi. Now, mind you, historically, uh, during the antebellum people period, uh, black people were the numeric majority in Mississippi, as we were in, in South Carolina and to a certain extent in Louisiana. But this, this changed profoundly after uh, the Great Migration from the 1910s to the 1970s, really. Um, so with this demographic shift, you kind of have this empty shell where folks are utilizing it the best they can to secure political victories. And in Mississippi, given the demographics of Mississippi, <laughs> it's an instrument that winds up being used fairly profoundly, uh, particularly in the late 1970s and 1980s, by black, black people, not without continued struggle. Uh, so one of the things uh, I would be remiss in saying that there, there's a champion whose name should be known far outside of Mississippi but it's, uh, it's not, uh, unfortunately, too much. Um, but it was one brother who championed the, the, the laws and the districting laws in Mississippi to be changed. Um, and that resulted 
uh, that case went on for about 10 years, starting in the late 1960s, and it was one. Uh, and eventually that wound up leading to a major redistricting uh, uh, process in Mississippi, which resulted in Mississippi accounting for then and accounting for now almost one third of all the black elected officials in the United States. So I want you to think about that, right? That, you know, like, uh, now, and his name was Henry Kirksey. Uh, who was very important to us because he was the first person uh, who the first iteration of the People's Assembly, which is called the People's Convention in the early 1990s, uh, put forward to run for mayor of the city of Jackson, uh, uh, initially in 1993. Uh, and there was a bunch of reasons why that just kind of went foul, but a lot of lessons learned from that. But Henry Kirksey, <coughs> excuse me, led that campaign. But the key thing here, um, turning minorities, solid minorities, into majorities. Mississippi currently has roughly about 2.5 million people. And according to the U.S. Census, it's roughly uh, 38 to 40 percent black, uh, 58 to 60 percent white. Um, now, uh, we take issue with that for a number of different reasons. Uh, a, how uh, race as a category is constructed has always been problematic. Uh, but there are also other significant populations in Mississippi uh, which are severely undercounted. Uh, the Choctaw being one, Mississippi Chinese being another, uh, Mississippi Vietnamese being another, and a growing Latino uh, population, which is not to say as significant as Alabama or uh, Georgia, but growing uh, nonetheless. And so we know it's severely undercounted. Then you have a lot of older black people who just refuse to be counted as well. So, uh, and do everything they can to not be counted. So, uh, but according to what they say, there's 2.5 million people. Now, given what I was saying about that solid block, all things being equal, part of our theory is that if we can hold that block and recruit 500,000 young white folks in particular to shift their political consciousness and shift their political allegiance. It gives us a majority in the state. So it's very concrete, not abstract. We've got real numbers about what we're trying to reach, why we're trying to reach it, and what we're trying to do, right? Because we could vote in the majority uh, and then change the state. And given the way the demographics are going, and, and given that we can maintain uh, a level of political and ideological uh, unity amongst that solid block, uh, there could be a profoundly different order uh, in Mississippi uh, within the next 10 years. And so for us, it's a critical piece because most folks you know, look at, uh, particularly a lot of liberal and even radical forces, kind of look at Mississippi as throwaway, like it's never, it's always been that way, it's always going to be that way, without really doing a concrete analysis of either demographics or politics, right? And so if we shut up, we, we cut ourselves short by not looking at concrete reality and not accepting a difficult challenge. Is it a challenge organizing white people to have a different politics in Mississippi? Hell yes, it's a challenge. <laughs> but is it possible? Yes, it's possible. It's very possible. Um, you know, we know that there are uh, pockets of folks who have different ideas that arise, uh, that arise independently of what anybody thinks or does, uh, organizing in their communities. The, the typical thing that we find, and we found through some different political campaigns over the four, past four or five years, is that folks have a challenge with being isolated, you know, in the, the, the eastern counties. And most of Mississippi's white population is in the eastern counties, the way our state is constructed as this kind of like an even split. So the eastern part is majority white, the western part is majority black. And that has to do primarily with soil quality, just so if you're wondering why. Yeah. Okay, the eastern part of the state is shell, old shell deposits, mm -hmm. limestone shell deposits, so it's not good for growing. The, old, the western part of the state is the alluvial flood, all that rich soil that got left for millions and millions of years of the Mississippi River bringing all that water from and dirt everywhere from throughout the country, three-fourths of the country, down into Mississippi to produce that rich soil. Uh, so that black dirt 
is what gave rise to you know the the hyper profitable uh, uh, sugar economy. Excuse me, uh, that was in Louisiana. The cotton economy. Uh, in Miss, well, both actually, but more cotton in Mississippi than sugar uh, in the Mississippi Delta. And that pattern, that demographic pattern, has not changed uh, in in 100 years, despite massive outflows of, of population, both black and white, right, the folks who've left the state of Mississippi. So those are the two things that you won't see uh, within either one of those works, which I think is a critical thing. Uh, as I've been listening, you know, uh, the past couple of days I've been here and, and hearing you all in different ways talking about the reality in, in uh, Madison and talk about the reality in uh, Wisconsin uh, and where we share, uh, at least right now, you know, some similarities in that, you know, we both exist under, uh, in effect, Tea Party, right? Not just yeah. Republican, but Tea Party uh, dominated legislatures, Tea Party gov government, uh, in effect, yeah. one party government. Uh, Mississippi's had that, I think, just a little bit longer than y'all have, but not much. You know, from, I think it's been six years now, right? So not much longer. But uh, it's something that the political culture is used to. And for us, uh, it's always a, a critical thinking of, you know, how do we turn uh, certain weaknesses into strengths? And how do we be very concrete about what we need and, and, and how to move? And those are two things I just want people to, to have a real grasp and understanding of, because I think for us, uh, I can say us making that shift about eight years ago. Uh, it, it, particularly the second shift, uh, it opened up a number of different uh, political possibilities for us. Now, we still have to figure out how to organize that 500,000 five, 500, people effectively. I don't want to give that impression. Uh, we've had some experiments that have been kind of fits and starts. Uh, one challenge we have, uh, which we're trying to change, is um, we've been able to recruit a good number of folks to come to Jackson over the past four years to come and get some organizing training. But then they don't want to leave. They don't want to go back home. <laughs> like, uh, we don't need you to organize in Jackson. We need you to organize, you know, at Mississippi State and Ole Miss and other places. We need you to go back home. So that's still a challenge, mm -hmm. uh, giving people, you know, the courage and the strength. And it's not just that people per se are scared. It's also there's a, there's a lack of jobs. There's a lack of opportunity. So it's not just a matter of moral issues or, or you know, just a political commitment. In some places, people going back home, there's really nothing there for them. So they, they would have to create something. And we're encouraging them. We're encouraging to, to folks to all throughout the state to try to do more cooperative organizing and for us to build our own networks and value chains so that we can support each other and build our own internal economy in a number of different ways. But that's going to take some time and some, some effort. But the two are definitely linked. So that's a few little lessons I can give about uh, our thinking, some of what is, you know, work, some of what we're experimenting that might be of some use to you uh, here in some of your work. The population demographics are profoundly different. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in Wisconsin, but uh, I would wager that uh, there are still consolidated minorities here that may not be based upon race, but are based upon more uh, class or world outlook and ideology that can be organized and moved uh, and, and used as a strategic pivot uh, to kind of fight back and, and reorient the, the society. So I'll leave it for questions. Um, you mentioned the uh, um, consolidated minorities, uh, but really what's happening here is that uh, <coughs> there's a much higher percentage of people who voted for Democrats in the assembly election, but because, because of gerrymandering. There were about 200,000 more votes total for Democrat Democratic candidates in the assembly, but uh, they got about one third of the total Six. legislators because of gerrymandering. So it's less a question of of uh, recruiting more people than allowing those people to have political expression. 
is that gerrymandering relatively new or has it been in place for a minute? Uh, it's fairly recent, a lot of it, because the 2010 census was, um, was uh, the, the trigger <coughs> for another redistricting. And that redistricting did not follow the normal process. It it was it was uh, brought about by external forces, um, uh, and I'm not sure exactly who who those people were. But uh, the legislators here in this state were definitely taking their orders from from other. I don't know if it was Alec or sure. if it was an external law. Uh, firm or exactly who was doing it, but there were other people doing it. No, I'm sure Alec had something to do with it. I mean, it, it, uh, we've been doing more tracing of Alec stuff the last two years, and um, in the, like that last year in the South, they introduced um, mm -hmm. 25 of the exact same bills all throughout the South. You know, probably, probably some of the, saw some of those same bills here. Yeah, they, they were tweaked a little bit different, yeah. than here, but it was basically the same thing. Uh, and you know, some folks looked up the the funding sources, you know, Coke and some of those, you know, forces. So they're they're deep at work. And we, know, I mean, from what I studied, here was one of the first major breakthroughs for that network. Yeah. So I mean, I think the the question. Um, I think it's a hard, um, you know, we're going to have to find some way to do some deeper organizing in these rural counties, I think, everywhere throughout this country. I don't know how, per se, but, you know, just the way that the system is set up uh, with the gerrymandering, with the electoral college. You know, and a number of hosts of different things around how the votes are counted or not counted at all. Uh, people who can't vote, which is a growing number of people. Uh, I think we're going to have to really figure that particular piece out. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how the different elements of the Jackson Cush plan fit together. That's say, so like the, you've got the People's Assemblies, the strategy around the cooperative movement and also the political strategy about building independent political organization. Now, it sounds like a great idea, uh, and it sounds a lot easier to say than what you actually managed to do in practice, because I feel like the story <coughs> there is fascinating, and I'm just interested in how you actually went about from the sort of, from the point at which you started organizing, how you managed to build all of these three different parts, how they fit together, uh, and so on. Good question. Um, the People's Assembly is the oldest, you know, outside of, of the, the New African People's Organization and the Black Men's Grassroots Movement. As political organization, the People's Assembly is old. And it has uh, a particular history that goes back to the late 1980s. And uh, that was really born uh, out of a, a struggle against the Klan. Jackson at that time, you know, Jackson, just so everybody knows, Jackson didn't become a majority black city until the mid-1980s. So it was relatively late that it made that transition compared to, say, a Detroit or Cleveland or a Maryland or, you know, I mean, uh, Baltimore or something like that. So it was relatively late for, and for a lot of reasons. Um, but uh, because of that late transition, you, you had in the late 1980s, you still had a, a very open concentration of Klan members who were on the force. And the police chief was an open Klan member. And so uh, part of what, uh, it was just a new African people's organization uh, then, in the late 1980s, uh, galvanized a, a coalition uh, to fight and push back you know, against that police chief and to get him fired. And, you know, folks got to remember this was, you know, uh, there was a wave, a high wave of uh, uh, Klan white supremacist activities in the late 70s and another high wave in the late 1980s and another wave 
uh, <coughs> mid 1990s. So these forces are there. They ain't gone nowhere. They, they you know just like now, there are people think they all just reemerged. No, they've always been there. They've ne they've never particularly gone anywhere, and they haven't been firmly uh, politically defeated. That's a, another political piece that I think we need to deal with. But anyway, um, uh, that piece existed first, um, and that had gained a certain kind of legitimacy, you know, from that period of the 1990s that I think is invaluable because there was actually a period of about six, seven years where there really wasn't much of a people's assembly, like the late 1980, late 1990s, early 2000s, uh, in part because of a lot of divisions in the community around uh, uh, how the first actual black mayor came into office. So the first actual, first black mayor that Jackson had was not until 1997, that was Harvey Johnson. Harvey was initially a part of the People's Convention process, but he refused to abide by it in 1992-93, and he wound up splitting the black vote uh, just enough so that the Kirksey couldn't get elected, right? And so uh, Jackson had a white man for another four-year term. Then the next go-around, Kirksey was, was called up again. He was like, look, I'm damn near 90 years old. Y'all need to find some new blood. I'm not doing this, right? And they just kind of left the gap because, in all honesty, I you know, remember coming in and doing some organizing. Uh, it was just too much ego tripping at the time, you know, uh, around who was going to have the spotlight. Not much of a vision, just people wanting to be in office. And so, because of that kind of division and split, it really just kind of lay dormant for a while. And what really kicked it back into gear was Hurricane Katrina. And folks, you know, either forget or don't particularly know because the story hasn't been told that way. But Mississippi actually took a lot of damage during Hurricane Katrina, a significant amount of damage. And, and Jackson took the fourth largest number of folks who were internally displaced by the storm, right? Uh, Houston was number one, uh, Dallas Fort Worth area number two, Atlanta number three, Jackson was number four, right? Uh, so there was a lot, large number of folks from Mississippi who just needed support, needed some solidarity, needed some you know people to take them in and, and show them around, uh, help them out, navigate the system, learn the lay of the land, etc. Um, so that's what really kind of kicked it back in. Um, and so that was up and moving as a as a standard thing. We had a smaller group just within uh, MXG that got started after September 11th. I think tank within the organization that recognized that after uh, September 11th that there was a new political reality inside the country and, and internationally, that it was basically a new game. And our analysis, even before they finalized that, was that, you know, we had lived through, several of us had lived through different aspects of COINTELPRO personally and been hounded by the FBI personally. So we knew what that was about and was like, you know, they're going to take that and put it on steroids which is what, in effect, they did. So we were figuring we had to adjust. You know, like, we can't operate in the same way. It's not going to be effective, right? And we can't even necessarily, our assessment was we can't even use some of the same language uh, uh, around national liberation and socialism. And, you know, we couldn't, it was like, we, we got to find new terms, new language, because all those things were going to be criminalized. In, in, you know, that was our assessment, right? And in, in effect, they have. Um, so we try to change and adjust. So the, the Jackson Cush plan came as a result of, of that. And it was really not just that the people assembly emerged around Katrina. It was that it was Katrina, our analysis of it, how important it was, um, that forced us to take that study group and pivot. And that's what came up with the Jackson Cush plan. And that's what came up with, you know, the, the, the notion that we should form our own political force. And that was based upon this analysis that I was saying about we have, a, based on what we had looked at, we have a solid minority here that can be turned into a majority, right? So it would be stupid of us to not utilize all the different means of struggle at our disposal where we could potentially, you know, win or gain some ground to not put some time and energy there. So what we did, we gave an experiment. The first one was 
Chuck was running for city council, and the second one was him running for mayor. Uh, and we won both of those, and then there were some other minor races that we also contributed to that for a while we were just like on an unstoppable streak, right, uh, in the electoral arena. Um, but uh, the, the piece around the cooperatives is something that uh, we have been studying uh, we, in this case, being like the New African People's Organization, MXG, for a long time. So it's, it's not like it's particularly new. I mean, we were, we were in, uh, um, to us, uh, we were familiar with the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. Uh, Chokwe's law firm helped out with the, the, the legal case uh, for the black farmers to get the land, some of the land back in the reparations there. So we had an intimate knowledge of, you know, what people were doing to a certain extent. The biggest gap, I think, for us was how do you translate what the Federation was doing into an urban setting, right? That, that was a piece that I think he, the Federation had to figure out and hardly know, at, at least in an urban setting in the South, let me make that clear. Like, how do you translate that? That hadn't been figured out. So cooperation in Jackson is really a, a major experiment in that regard on a couple of different levels of trying something like this on this scale in, a, in an urban area. Not that it hasn't been tried before, it has been tried in smaller levels, but building a kind of an ecosystem to see if it, it, it can be self-sustaining is a new challenge. Um, but the critical piece that I think, um, even in articulating all that and working on that for like 10 years, longer in fact, you'd be surprised how many differences still emerge between you know you and your comrades around. I thought we had agreement on this. I thought this was a strategy. I thought this is where we were going. And where that shows up most critically is what do we mean by independent political force, right? Uh, for me, and I'm speaking in the minority, it has always meant building an independent political party, something completely new. For others, it has meant operating within the confines uh, of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Uh, and there's, there's an ongoing tension that we have, you know, uh, uh, amongst ourselves around that. And I struggle every, every year, every election, let's go, independent, let's go. Mm -hmm. And other folks know you, you got to stay within the Democratic primary at the very least, because in Jackson, that's, historically, that is the real election. You win the Democratic primary, you win the election in, in, in Jackson. The second one, the general election, is really just a pro forma. There's no, Jackson 85% black, so they're in, there's like 0 0.2, you know, we know all the black Republicans in town, <laughs> literally. Um, um, so, you know, um, that's, that's kind of the game. So there is a cost of stepping out of that. There is an unknown barrier for stepping out of that that, that I will acknowledge. But I think it's, it's worth it. Uh, and I can say for me, as being one of the key architects of that, you know, uh, I wasn't so much initially interested in winning office, to be honest with you all. I was more interested in who actually, uh, by, by count of the vote, actually supported our politics. That's what I was more or less interested in. Like, what is our organic base? After 40 years of doing work in this community, what is our organic base? Because, you know, People who believe in what you believe in don't often show up at your membership meetings or they can't engage in all the crazy shit that we do. You know, they can't come meet seven days a week like we meet and, you know, do all of the kind of stuff. But they will support you in different ways. So we wanted to do an experiment like that to see. Um, and we got some of that information. And it's, it's interesting that our opponents actually um, did a, a study that we just, well, I shouldn't say that, but in, they did a study which gave us even more concrete information than, than we, we, we've had before. And it's, it's pretty uh, telling. Um, but the, the question around how do you integrate all those three, this is a longer discussion. But if I actually had to do it all over again, uh, I would have worked to do the co-op stuff first. 
after the people's assembly, I would have worked to do the co-op stuff first, then the electoral politics. And then the electoral politics. I think we did the order of operations wrong. And I think we did that because we did what we were most familiar and most comfortable with, like subconsciously, not, you know, like, uh, you know, I've started a, a few small businesses, but, you know, the, on the whole, that's not where most of our members and membership is, was, was at. And so transferring people's thinking <coughs> there has been, you know, a struggle. But I think it would have given us a much more profound basis to do a, a longer term kind of transformation looking at it now than running the, the for political office first. There's a question here and here. No, I just wanted a clarification that I thought I heard you say people's assembly first, then co ops. Right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Why, why, so can you explain that sequence? The people's assembly. Um, the people assembly gives legitimacy to whatever you want to do. Let me just put it that way, you know, the simplest way. It gives legitimacy to whatever you want to do. And if organized right, you get a clear sense of what your base is. You know, who's going to work with you, what kind of support, what kind of, what kind of labor can you uh, rely upon. And to put it in most concrete material terms, you know, you, we, we ran electoral campaigns where there was nobody who got paid. You know, we we're doing some, you know, Cooperation Jackson has a few people who get paid, but mostly it's a great deal of whatever you see doing is volunteer hours, you know, people being motivated to, to support the mission, right? And um, for us, it gives us a greater read on the level of commitment that people have to the overall project. The electoral piece changes some of that dynamic. Because we learned, you know, we knew it, but we learned it on a deeper level. You know, so many people, and rightfully so, because they need jobs, but so many people had joined on who weren't even a part of the People's Assembly for a Chopra's mayoral campaign, hoping to get a job. Right? So it, it kind of put us in a weird space at different times, like, are you with us because you believe in what we're doing? Or are you just hanging on in the hope and aspiration that something is going to come out of this on the on the back end for you. So we would always say then, and we always say now, if you go to Chokeway Antar's, you know, campaign office, and say the only guarantee that we're going to, you know, give you is that we're going to give good government. Now, what that means is another question, but mm -hmm. that's that's what we tell you about. You're not you don't if you come here looking for a job, you're in the wrong place. If you come here doing you know looking for you, you're in the wrong place. Did you learn any do's and don'ts about how to do this people's assembly? It's a constant learning of do's and don'ts. Um, one big one, don't confuse a people's assembly with a town hall. It's not the same thing, or it shouldn't be. In our, in our view, it shouldn't be the same thing. And we've done some that are just more like town halls. And we, we got into a pattern, I think, uh, particularly the, the last year of Chokwe's life and the year after he died. <laughs> Well, they were very much didactic, like just talking at people and not information, not stuff organically coming from the community or things coming directly from the, like the task force, which is like the coordinating body. Uh, so that's one. It's not a town hall. Uh, if you really want it to be or, or an organic space that's operating as a power unto itself, you know, that can, that can challenge both the state and give the community the legitimacy to act on its own. It's here then. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in concretely what sort of uh, economic initiatives are in, substantively in these uh, in the work of co-ops that have been incubated through the cooperation in Jackson. And in that context, what uh, public policy objectives might expand the space for that? Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're uh, if you're trying to see cooperation and worker cooperatives in particular as the core of a new kind of solidarity, social economy, that still interfaces with the market, but it's done so in this cooperative mode, mm -hmm. and, and you're doing it at the urban level, I mean, that sort of naturally says, well, what could cities do to expand the space for that? What, what are the bottlenecks that you're facing? Mm -hmm. uh, 
Well, that's what I was supposed to do and when I worked for Chokwe. Uh, it, the, the, I forget what the title was. We just made up something. Uh, <laughs> um, Director of Special Projects and External Funding. And what my real task was was build the solidarity economy, right, and come up with the policy stuff that we need to, to give this some reinforcement. And the Jackson Rising Conference was, was built to be kind of a rollout of what we were aiming to like introduce. Uh, it didn't, unfortunately, because it was on time, it didn't serve in that uh, functional purpose, but that was the thinking. Um, but let me ask you a question backwards. So uh, we have a catering uh, co-op, uh, which is working to get a cafe officially open. Uh, our city has a furlough, uh, you know, where, where um, basically uh, the city government in Jackson right now only functions Monday through Wednesday uh, because of this furlough and a quiet strike by uh, the workers in the city uh, because of this debt. So there's like a backlog of permits and everything getting filed. So we have a catering business uh, and sometimes sell coffee and stuff like that. Um, with that one. Um, we have the green team, which uh, is doing lawn care and uh, compost. Uh, we have Freedom Farms, which is right now the largest, and they're actually expanding you know, production as we speak. Uh, urban farming. Um, I feel like I'm forgetting something. Oh, and then uh, uh, the community production co-op. Uh, which is like a 3D printing lab that we're working on, uh, opening up. So we've, we've sent a couple of folks to get some training on how to do that and working on setting that up and, and doing like a two-year grace year period of uh, prototyping and skill development and training and coding along with that. Um, then there's too many other things that are kind of going on at one time, to be honest with you. So we have a land trust. We own about 50 so 50 plus plots now uh, in a concentrated area in uh, West Jackson. Um, that's where Freedom Farms is doing all of its, you know, uh, farming on um, all of the facilities that that uh, we have or we own. They're all part of that uh, land trust. And the, the the thing with the land trust is we're fighting. We're in a major war against gentrification and displacement, which is uh, coming our way. Um, very deliberate and intentional. So we're trying to hold it off as best we can. Um, that's a longer conversation. But those are the, the basic ones, and there's a few other things that are like a little bit further behind that. There's a major effort right now, which is taking up too much of my time, quite frankly, um, but for good cause, um, for people's grocery. So there's a black grocer uh, right down, literally right down the street from us, uh, only less than a five minute. Uh, walk away. Uh, one of the only one of three black grocers, you know, still in the city. Um, he just received some support to move his operation to the south uh, part of Jackson, uh, to South Jackson, which needs a grocery store. So if you're down in South Jackson, there's literally some parts of South Jackson, there's no grocery store, you know, uh, within a five mile radius of your house. So they need one. But it, it leaves a hole. Uh, in, in our community, which is not as much of a food desert as South Jackson is. Uh, so we're trying to work with him. There's a coalition of folks that's been coming together, uh, meeting the last couple of weeks to try to work with him to uh, start this grocery. But there's a bit of a timeline kind of crunch, you know, which we're working uh, under. Uh, and our, our thing, because of this battle with gentrification, we don't like renting anything. Right, um, so we always make things a little bit harder for ourselves by trying to raise all the upfront mm -hmm. capital off the top mm -hmm. to just buy the, the facility. So we want to buy the lot uh, that that property you know, uh, is on, so we don't have to rent anything. Um, and in many respects, you know, uh, just having political office is not kind of a guarantee against gentrification. Um, 
and in some respects, you know, land ownership. <coughs> and if you can take it from our vantage point, <coughs> decommodifying the land is to the greatest extent possible is the greatest defense you have against gentrification. So that's what we're trying to do. So would you say that the biggest bottleneck for really dramatic <coughs> expansion from this initial set of initiatives is the failure of um, access to credit and capital market, you know, I don't mean capital markets in the standard capitalist sense, but the inability to raise sufficient capital to either buy space or land to create that infrastructure? That's a, that's a, that's a major challenge, period, for anything in, in, in uh, Jackson. For black folks, we put it that way, maybe specific. For black folks, credit to access for black folks is damn hard, period. Um, and you know, you there's a racket that exists in Jackson, uh, which you know it's not uncommon uh, for Jackson per se. But uh, uh, some of the bigger black businesses on paper, they're just really fronts for white operations, and they're just fronts so that those white operations can get preferred city and government contracts. Right? So, like the biggest developer, the biggest black developer in Jackson and, and in the state. I think he owns like two trucks, you know, hardly any equipment, you know, so he just gets the contracts and then subs the stuff out and just keeps on, just keeps the front, basically, up. And even him, you know, he, it's hard for him to get access to a loan without his major benefactors write this stuff off. And this is after being in business, you know, in this relationship for over 30 years. So that access to finance, access access to credit is a major piece. Um, I mean, our basic uh, uh, strategy, which is, uh, you know, how sound it is remains to be seen, but uh, we've been very clear, we ain't gonna get no money from the good old boy network in Mississippi. It's not happening. They're not giving us a penny. So we got to, you know, uh, really, Ask folks, you know, throughout the country for resources on, on that nature. To into to this to this point, we've done a decent job. I think we can do better. And I'm the main person who does like the fundraising, and I'm, I I suck at it. But, you know, we get a, a little bit here and there. Um, enough us enough keep moving. But it's something. It's a skill I'm trying to learn. And there's some parts I'm not, I'm not trying to learn. Tell you the truth, right? I'm like. There's a limit to which I got to where I'm, I clearly am willing to go uh, within that world and, and you know play on on those terms. And my head is constantly: How do I get out of this logic? How do I get out of this game? You know, how do we create? How do we create an anti-capitalist business model? You know, I, I've been that consumes many of my nights just trying to: How do you do that? You know, who's done that before? You know, so no solid answers, but a lot of experimentation. So there was a woman here and then a woman here. Yeah, I was wondering how specifically, like, what you've done <coughs> so far to get the 500,000 white people to change their political consciousness. I didn't hear you. Um, what is the plan, if there's one set in place yet, to get the 500,000 white young people to change their political consciousness that you said at the beginning? How do you expect to do that? The things we've done so far are like Freedom Summers in reverse. We've done three of those, uh, kind of quietly. Uh, we've, uh, you know, there's a there's a good number of. Uh, I'm not a particular fan of this term, but there's a there's a good number of uh, anti-racist uh, white organizers that we know throughout the country. Uh, that we've called in to, to do training with some of our white members. And we have white members, so folks should know that. We have white members. It's not a black-only organization, or was it intended to be a black-only uh, organization. <coughs> um, uh, so to do some specific training, we've been doing that from day one. And some of it's been helpful, some of it hasn't. So, I mean, like, one thing, one lesson we've learned very clearly um, from that is, as much as I love, you know, uh, all my comrades like from the Bay in New York, they not what's needed to organize white folks in the South. 
you know, they, they just don't get the flow, they don't get the rhythm, they don't get the personal relationships. So we've been much more deliberate like this last year. And like, you know, let's bring some folks from Georgia, let's bring some folks we know from Alabama, let's bring some other folks we know from Mississippi, from Kentucky, from Tennessee, you know, uh, to do some of that work so people understand, you know, some aspects of the cultural context a, a little bit stronger. And, you know, we've seen a little bit more results, I think, the, the last two years with that. Uh, so, yeah, this question, it might be a little bit too abstract, it's just something I've been thinking about recently um, a lot, um, partially just from having traveled around the world and um, looking at other societies and where they work, and um, getting a really strong sense that here in America, it's really hard for people to um, work together to better their communities um, because of uh, my impression is because of, of political influences and people are just really divided. And, um, you know, I, I live in a co-op now and I, I've worked in, in co-ops and, uh, you know, I, I really strongly believe in them. <coughs> but also through working in them, I, I realize a lot of the contradictions. Um, and uh, my question is, um, have you uh, encountered or thought much about uh, the being able to to um, kind of bridge the gap between um, this cooperative movement, which I see is kind of like a far left wing um, endeavor, and then like the far right wing kind of libertarian community, um, which recently I've had a lot of opportunity to interact with, and it seems like there's a lot of um, similarities in terms of self-sufficiency, or um, I guess mostly self-sufficiency seems like uh, the, the commonality. Um, have you had any experience with that, um, or no? Um, not positive ones. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I mean, libertarian doesn't doesn't have the same. Meaning, I think, in our context, that it might it might have here. Um, um, in our context, you know, I would I would say at least since about two thousand nine, to hear on the ground forces reference something like libertarianism. Um, was being used in the same way that people are now kind of using alt-right, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, and it seemed like alt-right got constructed uh, in part to clarify by, by libertarians that they were saying, you're giving us a bad name, <laughs> you know, so they were kind of, I think, forcing people to clarify their politics. And that's where some of this alt-right language started to emerge. I, I know I first heard the term in 2012. Um, and I remember laughing at it initially. Um, um, yeah, I, I mean, the, what, there's, there's surface, like, just, you know, it's the same thing I would say, like, uh, was saying about the, the politics. Just because we use some of the same words in English don't mean that we mean the same thing, right? And, and what they mean, often in my experience, by uh, self-sufficiency is profoundly different than what I mean by self-sufficiency. Uh, you know, so it's a clumsy word in the context of how me using it. I'm using it in the context of a community, of relationships far and, and beyond myself, not as an individual dynamic. You know, uh, uh, it's being intentional about creating <coughs> relationships in my community, healthy relationships. It's not being used to mean, you know, some individual atomized 
being, you know, some Ayn Rand creature. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not the same thing. So sometimes it may seem like we could have a conversation, but in practice, at least in our context, mm -hmm. like, you know, what's, what it actually comes down to is like we ain't, we're not on the same page. We're actually using these words in profoundly different ways. And you got to keep in mind, one, one of the things that Mississippi has had since uh, um, 20, when, when did, when did, uh, when did the, the, the young woman, uh, forgetting her name right now, she, she climbed up in South Carolina and took the, the flag, that, was that 2014? That was, that was 2014, 2015? Whatever it was, I can't remember when it was. You have to forgive me. Um, that sparked, you know, for about a year period throughout the South and nationally to a certain extent, you know, a movement to uh, take down all of these Confederate monuments and symbols. You know, which wasn't just restricted to the South. Because I heard actually one of the Ivy League schools just uh, got rid of the Calhoun. Yeah, yeah, did right. So it wasn't just there's a couple other ones in the north. I think also did something similar. So it wasn't just res restricted to the south, but definitely kind of concentrated there. The only state that hasn't budged on that in one iota is Mississippi, and Mississippi is the only state that still has the official uh, battle flag emblem of the Confederate state as part of its state emblem. That's that's there and has been there since the 1890s. And there was, a, there was a referendum that happened in 2001 to change the flag, it lost. And so there's been a, a movement since then, since, since she did this, you know, with folks demanding that the state be changed. And it's gained a little momentum. But the libertarian forces, the alt-right forces, they have come out hardcore in defense of their heritage and tradition and, you know, so they, that struggle has created certain clarification, certain clarifying kind of like battle lines, you know, uh, in our context that have always been there. But, you know, it's like when you see these forces, uh, and they've tried. I mean, they're, they're, your question is they've, they've tried to come into, they were trying in 2014 to come in some parts of the black community. Uh, through churches and have like dialogues and stuff like that. So they, they were actually trying in Jackson anyway. <coughs> um, but it just, it wouldn't go nowhere, you know, because uh, there just wasn't really enough synergy. There's, there's no real commitment on those forces to uh, relinquish any aspect of white supremacy, to relinquish any, you know, ongoing uh, uh, attachment to this as a separate colonial project. There's, there's just, they're not fundamentally there. So there's just no basis for political alignment with them. So our, our recruitment has been finding folks who are much more community inclined, not individually inclined. That's where we've been trying to recruit folks. Yeah, you um, briefly mentioned uh, organizing a plan uh, in Mississippi, and I was just curious. Um, I actually used to be a labor organizer in North Carolina myself, and you didn't talk too much about your relationship to the sort of traditional organized labor with Cooperation Jackson. I would just be curious to hear about that, or if there is any relationship, what your thoughts are. Uh, we are pushing very hard to get uh, our brothers and sisters in the unions to work with us to form basically in essence like a, a citywide IWW, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. um, we are indulged uh, by them allowing us to take the lead on a May Day program. So we've done a May Day program the last two years. We're going to do another one this year. Um, the UAW is the strongest supporter uh, of it. 
the teachers union is the second uh, strongest supporter of it. Uh, and I won't speak about the rest on camera, but, um, <laughs> but we are trying, you know, it's not something that's part of our larger uh, organizing, uh, you know, vision. Yeah. You know, one of the things that you will hear us say that, you know, we describe the Lumumba Center as, as a temple of labor um, and try to be very clear with everybody that, you know, this is what it is and what we're aiming to do. Uh, and we've done a fair amount of education of mixed results with, with different, particularly younger folks in the, in, the, uh, in the union, you know, staff, uh, about the, the history uh, between cooperatives and uh, the union movement, particularly focused on that, at, at, at least in this country and other. European context that they were actually at one point one and the same and had two different kind of things. So that's kind of germinating some ideas. Um, but I mean it's they they don't really have that much power in Mississippi. So I think, you know, uh, for them sometimes they take our kind of request as just another layer of something that it's just it's a part of their task list of what they try to do, which is you know nothing you know negative. I've ever been you know union organizer myself, uh, so I, I you know I understand it. I have my issues and contradictions with it. You know, uh, and I have my issues and contradictions with the very form. You know, as we've come to uh, accept it. You know, from uh, I think really the settlement of the Labor Relations Act. I think. Uh, that's a whole other conversation, but, um, uh, but that's a natural ally for us. So it's, it's something that we're going to always continue to keep reaching out for and to build relationships with. And so where, where we actually, I think, have the most kind of dialogue um, outside of some of the May Day stuff, um, one of our organizers is kind of the de facto Fight for 15 organizer now. Um, you know, so we've been deeply involved in that in, in Jackson. Uh, and we're working pretty hard with the, the uh, public employees to pull something together once Chokeway wins. So part of what, part of what we want to try to do uh, is to actually organize them to have uh, Workers' assemblies. Once Chokwe gets in office, uh, and, and to en to engage and to take the lead and engage in, in, in the participatory budgeting process, um, and to try to flip that whole piece on its head. So I mean, it's, it's a core part of what we think about and try to to do. And now I don't talk about it that much, to be honest with you. You know, just. There's a layer of bureaucracy that you know that you have to deal with. That I don't have to. On my end, I don't have to deal with. You know, um, uh, but it's a key part of what we're what we're trying to do for the vision of the transformation of the city. Uh, do you have any direct connections with uh, North Carolina's more on Monday? Mm -hmm. uh, Brenda Scott. Um, who was the leader of, of the public uh, uh, sector employee? She, there's a Moral Monday Mississippi movement. She's one of our members, uh, and she's the leader of that. So that that's our most direct connection. Uh, but to be honest with you, we we we've taken we have a critical view of that movement in, in some respects, in many respects. Uh, you know, uh, there is a hardcore, amongst the leadership, there's been a hardcore kind of anti-left tendency there that has been, been, in my view, and this is maybe just my own personal view, that has been very uh, antagonistic to Black Workers for Justice in North Carolina. Um, you know, so, uh, They've had a few, you know, when there's been like some fundraising things, 
uh, Ford Foundation had something and somebody else came down. They invited us to come. They don't give us no money. They invited mm -hmm. us to come, um, you know, and engage. And so I got a chance to meet a couple of the folks there. And, you know, just on one occasion was able to ask some questions about you know, something that was happening there. And I, I didn't particularly, uh, they, were, they were a real, very kind of hostile reaction. Um, um, the other piece, the deeper piece, is how tied that is to the Democratic Party, and that's very problematic to me as an individual. Did um, you say what it is? More Mondays. Yeah, more Mondays in, in <laughs> North Carolina now. The past <laughs> six years. Yeah, pretty close to that. I'm not sure exactly. It's been going on, I think, since 2012, but North Carolina. I think in 2012, uh, also switched over to having a uh, Tea Party governor and a supermajority. And they immediately went after privatizing uh, the schools and changing all kind of laws. But they went and do a, did a whole major series of just attacks, redistricting. And the NAACP uh, leadership in a bunch of churches there started doing a protest every Monday. Uh, at the state capitol, and it, it grew to be pretty significant 2014, 2015. It's still pretty significant, I would say. Um, uh, uh, you know, and, and it's often cited as, as one of the strongest kind of uh, social movements we have in the country in a lot of kind of like liberal circles. Uh, and a lot of states, you know, including a lot of labor folks in different states, you know, I think it supported it, tried to do similar things in Georgia, I know in Mississippi, uh, Kentucky, um, with mixed results. But, you know, in North Carolina, it's still been pretty much a bedrock. Uh, and they played a key role in um, uh, the governor having to give up the seat here earlier. Is that this year, or June, or November? Yes. November. Yo, I got to forget my, being a little sick, my time. <laughs> But yeah, so I mean, um, this is probably more for a conversation, uh, you know, tomorrow. Um, but you know, anywhere I go at this point, um, I'm I'm calling for us to have a serious debate about our relationship with the Democratic Party. Uh, understanding that everybody's circumstances is different, you know, your context is different than my my context. <clears throat> But I want to raise it as a serious question that I think left and progressive forces in this country have to look at because it's not, it's long since been a, a vehicle, you know, that makes any pretension on really organizing or supporting working class people. And to me, it's like, are we, you know, using Malcolm's language, are we going to continue to be chumps, you know, or are we going to do what we need to do in our own interest. I would hope that we do need to do what we need to do in our own interest. And that's a harder road, mm -hmm. but I don't, you know, we one state short now of a constitutional convention with the strategy that they've been using. So, you know, uh, keep going down this road. Uh, they'll reorder, reorganize everything and won't need the violence of fascism in order to create a new structure. They'll just do it legally. You mentioned that um, part of your strategy is to hold your black um, um, and you've referred it in a number of ways to um, wanting this to really be an organic movement where people believe in the, um, the kind of new economy you're trying to build. Can you talk a little bit about what are the challenges within the black community in Jackson or Mississippi more broadly? Um, in um, thinking about, talking about, considering, accepting, buying in to an alternative kind of economy? Uh, working together, <laughs> one challenge. Uh, working together democratically, that should be more specific, is a challenge. Uh, we found in, in our work that uh, um, People are used to having a boss. 
and and we recreate that in a lot of different ways, consciously and subconsciously. Uh, we we recreate that in a number of different ways. So creating you know real accountability systems within our our co-ops is a that's an ongoing struggle that we are in all the damn time, uh, all the damn time. You know people showing up on time and you know doing what they say they're gonna do. And, you know I'm sure many of y'all know this, but that's that's one. Um, one is generational, but not exclusively generational. Um, you know, the American dream is a powerful thing. It's a very powerful thing. And, you know, people believing and wanting and aspiring to be rich, you know, is something that, you know, somebody's mind is in part here doing the, the labor, but their aspiration is, you know, I'm gonna be become a millionaire off of selling, you know, urban farmers. Like, no, you're not. It's not gonna happen. <laughs> you know, you'd be barely lucky if you break even. You know, uh, and and the point is, you know, what we're trying to get in, in part, but a lot, number of different things is, we're trying to improve the quality of life, not maximize profit. So those, it's, a, it's a different thing, and that's a, that's a struggle. I think people, what we've experienced is there's an intellectual acceptance, but the practice of it is, is a different thing. And I think it's you know, just being patient with each other, with, our, with ourselves. Um, you know, we don't live in a democratic society. We're not even remotely democratic society. And so to expect people to, to try to make democratic experiment when they've never experienced it before, you actually, actually climb a tall mountain. And that's something I think we was just in the last year that we've come to really just accept and embrace. Like we've said it, but now, you know, because of some fits and starts and ups and downs and some failures here and there, it's like, okay, this, this is a hard thing that we got to really pay more attention to. So I, th I think those are the two biggest things that we see, you know, and, and so you understand Cooperation Jackson. Cooperation Jackson is a very young organization. I mean, most of our members are under 25. By far and away, most of them are under 25. And several of them have, this is the first job they've ever had. You know, um, you know so there's, there's, as a result, there's a lot of, you know, people are there but they're just kind of standing around, <laughs> you know, often like, well, what am I supposed to do? You know, what, you tell me what I'm supposed to do. Even after you've gone through and made plans and, you know, got the whole spreadsheets and the charts and like, okay, you, you know, you know, you're supposed to do this tomorrow morning. You're supposed to do that. They get there and they're still, what am I supposed to do? You know, where am I? So we still, that's a challenge. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a serious challenge. Um, the other bigger challenge is, 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 is the capital question. I mean, that's the, that's the biggest piece. And so a lot of, you know, our thinking has been, how do we, how do we set up what we need with the minimal amount of capital as possible, right? And then for us, it's also, you know, been very mindful that, you know, um, I've been very one who's pushing this, like, look, you know, we the shiny new thing right now, but that ain't gonna last, you know. Uh, and, you know, a lot of the press and stuff we get right now, two years in there, that's gonna be completely gone, you know. Uh, so don't expect that to save you. Don't expect that to draw in a bunch of resources. So at the end of the day, you know, two or three years from now, it's the relationships that we build now that's gonna sustain us, you know, not because we're going to develop a whole new set of relationship with these banks mm -hmm. or, you know, some alternative financial institutions that we are trying to create. You know, so one project that we're involved in uh, is with the Southern Grassroots Economies Project as a reparations, Southern Reparations Loan Fund, right? And it, it has some promise, but, you know, it's, it's <clears throat> trying to serve 13 states with like $2 million. You know, it's uh -huh. it's minuscule. I'm not saying it's not important. 
but I'm also <laughs> like a realist and like that's that's like a drop in the bucket. So um, you know, it's always caution people that at some point, you know, it's it's gonna be pretty rough. So we gotta get prepared for that now. In in knowing, you know, uh, Mississippi has one of the weirdest things um, that uh, you know, I, I grew up primarily, not exclusively, but primarily in California. You know, families from the South, obviously. Primarily California boy. And um, I remember maybe 10 years ago when folks were explaining to me uh, why there's no uh, Bank of America and like Wells Fargo uh, in the state of uh, Mississippi. That once the, the reconstruction, uh, excuse me, the, Government said defeated the reconstruction. Somebody help me out. Redemption. The redemption. There you go. Uh, the redemption government came into power in, in uh, Mississippi. They changed the like the finance law, or the, you know like the banking law in Mississippi. That if you want to get a charter in the, to operate in the state of Mississippi, you have to be. Uh, accepted by the four original charter members to do banking operations in the state of Mississippi. <clears throat> right, and, you know, that just blew me away. You know, that was, it was just, and it was in the context of a, of a, of a struggle. Um, we weren't in office or anything there, and I was uh, there supporting some chokeway at, at the legal office that we were doing, and was trying to make an argument with this, with this white businessman, that if he did it, if he did his business in a certain way, he would actually make more money. Which, if you know me, is like that's one of the craziest. I don't know how in the world I was making that argument, but it just didn't make. What he was doing just didn't make any sense. And it was, I remember the point on his face where he remembered, like I can, I can do this this way, and it'll actually make me more money. But if I do it this way, it'll give these black workers more social freedom. And he'd rather have the social control than make more money. That's Mississippi. Mm -hmm. I'd rather, you know, they like our plantation is fine the way it is. We can, we, yeah, we can make more money if we do some things in another way. But this is ours, <clears throat> and we ain't changing. I mean, that's a deep, 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 deep mentality that exists, you know, amongst the old kind of landed gentry in Mississippi. I'm not saying it's everybody, clearly, but you know, that's a that's a deep notion that you'll find often time and time again when you're trying to engage with state legislatures or where it's, if it's a question of money and social control, 99% of the time they're going to go with social control over making, over maximizing profit. So it's like you're not even an efficient capitalist machine, which is what you know, the state and party is set up to be, you'd rather be something else. You know, and with that kind of dynamic, since they control the, the banks and the money, we know that's going to be an ongoing piece, and we know that they're going to, you know, come after us politically. So one thing I didn't, I was sharing with some other folks. Uh, somebody asked us, you asked us about the policy stuff. We exist in this funny context right now, at least on the municipal level. You know, we have a solid um, set of allies that form a four or three majority on the city council, seven, seven members of city council. We can, we can pretty much almost get anything passed that we want on city council. I mean, literally. Um, but we, we are in this phase now kind of like, what's the point? Because the state government automatically is going to come down, especially now, and try to crush that, right? So it's more or less us to kind of develop a practice of let's, can change, let's do as much as we can to change the facts on the ground. And that, in the long term, will have the more, more political, you know, substantive um, impact for once we kind of get back in office and set some things up. Then trying to get it now, then get struck down, then you're in a fight to, you know, uphold what you've got passed on the municipal level that is keeping you from building. So we had to make a choice given our limited capacity. Try to do, do some things, just do it and do it under the radar. 
and you know, if, if need be, you ask for permission later. But they, they strike it down on preemption grounds that it's not your authority, or just no, they just make shit up. Like you know, <laughs> yeah. they just make it up. Okay. Like like um, I, I literally, and I'm not making this up. People can look it up. I went to uh, Lima, Peru, in, in um, 2015. Um, we do a lot of climate justice, just transition work. So I went on a small delegation, a couple of members. We went to Lima, Peru for the World Conference Against Race, uh, um, um, <coughs> the climate change negotiation. I forget the word. But uh, came back and did a, a report back in a press conference about it. And that was in December. And we did the press conference the first week of uh, January. Our legislative session starts the th second week. You know, they don't really start proposing anything until the third week. There was no bill uh, that from what we had examined earlier that said anything about climate change. But by that, by the end, by the end of February, when it was time for them up, the one of the uh, representatives from Rankin County, which is right next right next door to Jackson, which is predominantly all white working class county, <coughs> he put forth a bill. It's the same guy who put a fourth bill to take our airport, by the way. He put forth a bill that said that the state of Mississippi would not comply with any UN mandates, you know, regarding climate change. And it's like, where would that come from? Other other than one small little visit of, you know, me and a couple other people going and doing, you know, something that made the local TV. So it's that type of just reaction of, yeah, it's just spite a lot of times. And so now Jackson is technically a, a, a sanctuary city. Chokwe passed the ordinance when he was in uh, uh, city council to make uh, Jackson a sanctuary city. They are, uh, they, the house, our house uh, just passed a, a bill uh, punishing Jackson for being uh, a sanctuary city. Right? And, like, and they're talking about taking uh, funding away, some aspects of uh, 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 police jurisdiction, uh, a way to give the surrounding counties, but particularly two, you can imagine with two, mm -hmm. that, that are, they would have authority to come in to Jackson and to Hines County, which is illegal, and arrest people, right, according to this bill that they're creating. So that's the level of, you know, but I mean the larger project is how do we dismantle this, this black stronghold this black progressive bastion. That's the ultimate project that they have. How do they fracture it? How do they split it up? How do they dilute it? And they're very clear about that. You know, just clear as we are about Jackson Cush plan, they're very clear about we're going to destroy that plan. So I'm wondering if it's how you're feeling. Normally we quit at 5.30. Um, I can do one more and then I'm... One more question? <laughs> yeah, I can do one and more. And that more. sounded too like a good segue into tomorrow, what you were just talking yeah. about. So one more question. Yeah, I was wondering if there's any um, processes or structures that you find <coughs> helpful or essential to uh, living and working in community with uh, the avoiding that fracturing and fragmentation that comes from the conditioning we have uh, growing up in this capitalist economy, not democratic society. Uh, we are looking and searching all over the globe for <laughs> solutions. <laughs> to some of those uh, problems. You know, there's some things that we've tried and be like, that don't work for us, you know. For whatever. I mean, some aspects of like sociocracy, it didn't really work for us, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So it's like, uh, and then there's some aspects of our own Malcolm X version of consensus. Mm -hmm. We tried it and it didn't, it didn't work in the co-op uh -huh. session, right? Um, so we, you know, we, experiment and modify. We've been very clear about, you know, we want you to go study this and bring it back. We want you to go study this and bring it back. Uh, and and be open, you know, to, to learning. So currently are you still on sort of a Robert's Rules of Order? No. Rules no, it's, kind of thing? Or you doing it's, a modified consensus? Or? It's like a modified consensus. This is how most of things operate. And what about like conflict resolution <laughs> stuff? That's a bit more complicated. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so there's cooperation in Jackson overall. Yeah. And then there's each one of the co-ops. Yeah. 
which are affiliated but, but autonomous. Yeah. And so there's generalities, but all of them also have their own internal dynamics. So Freedom Farms is by far and away, I would say, feel comfortable saying, Freedom Farms is by far and away internally the most developed, right? Because they've, they've sit there and just struggled with each other about accountability and, you know, they, 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 they still have their problems, but they've went through that struggle in part because uh, last year, you know, they, they missed like a whole crop rotation, right? And uh, Brandon, who many of you may know, was like, this is bullshit, you know, like, and got on folks about it. So they went through and struggled, and they're at a, the, to me, they're at a qualitative different place in just where they're at compared to, you know, a lot of other stuff. And then, you know, uh, yeah, it's just, it's different. So there's a general operation, which is a modified consensus, mm -hmm. and then other, the co-ops have slightly different ways in which they're dealing with stuff, which is based upon how do you serve the needs of the people, the individuals in front of you, you know, uh, rather than some abstract theory. And I think that's, that's where we are kind of landing, like, you know, we're going to study and learn as much as we can from any and everybody, you know, as long as it seems to make some sense and is headed in a democratic, you know, uh, uh, orientation. But the practice is primary, and that's what's ultimately going to determine what we do and how we do it, not an adherence per se to, you know, sociocracy or whatever. That's not how we operate. You know, and that's very intentional on our, our part. You know, trying not to be too dogmatic. Like I'm familiar with this sense of what is it? Sociocracy. It's a governance structure developed in Sweden where. Um. <laughs> 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 yeah, I've heard steps. Yeah, please explain I thought it. you were in. <laughs> uh, so it's just really briefly, it's like sort of a, uh, for me it appears like a, some streamlined processes that get to results similar to consensus and ways to organize yourselves that build in like some nice, I, I, I like it, but um, processes for mutual accountability and kind of depersonalizes critique somewhat because it's always really based in vision, mission, and aim. So. And to be clear about what, what hasn't necessarily worked for us uh, uh, with, it, with it is the uneven development of our members. That's what hasn't worked. Can you expand on that? So we we in the, we're in the process of, of, of revealing and calling our hierarchy for what it is. Mm -hmm. So we don't act as if there's, you know, there isn't a hierarchy. Right, we are very explicit. There is a hierarchy in our practice, and we are struggling to undo it. Right, and we're asking people to struggle to undo it. So, you know, just being honest and transparent, I'm one of the people that's at the top of the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Right, and with the knowledge, experience, you know, that I have and have accumulated, you know, in relationships that I have that not the whole of the organization has, and that's power and that's privilege in, in different ways. So how you how do you surrender that? How do you transfer that over? How do you impart that to other people? So I have to be accountable to to my you know members about this is what I'm doing. This is why I need you to step up and and you take this up or we democratic decide who's doing that. You know, but the reality of, of the situation oftentimes is, you know, sometimes certain questions that come up or certain you know like commitments that come up, and people don't have some of the young people in particular might not know our relationship with somebody else. And that's where it comes in, but like, ah, hold up, hold up, you know, there's something more to this than you might know or seems on the surface. And so we just try to call it out and be like, look, you know, there's an information gap, there's an experience gap, and we have to learn how to overcome that. We don't know how to do it, we're just struggling to try to be intentional about calling it out and then surfacing like, okay, you know, like, I'll use something, you know, I'll say, oh, blah, blah, blah. Where did that get, you know, people, and Saki's proud of being, who's, who's my wife, she wanted to put, but where did that come from? Mm. <laughs> you know, like, I ain't never heard of that. Or, yeah. You know, Let's service that. Yeah, like, yeah. What, what is that about? You know, so, you know, 
it's those type of things that you, you we have to be clear and intentional about and not act like they don't exist or that you live in some utopia. You know, it's like we're struggling for democracy. We don't have it. That's what we said. We're struggling for it. We don't have it. Well, if this is how he is when he's not feeling well, I just want to see him like when he is. When he is.